fancy a little extra dose of MotoGP during your week? Well, you've come to the right place. This is OMG MotoGP Extra, your quick hit uh, of all the latest news and a preview of this weekend's Austrian Grand Prix. My name is Harry Benjamin. Keith Hewen uh, is alongside me as always. Um, but before we actually dive into to all things Austria, uh, Keith, there was some sad news uh, coming out this week, wasn't there? Yeah, Haruki Noguchi, who was, um, you know, in just comes off the back of his biggest race, the Suzuka 8 hour. Finishing on the podium, originally third, but then when uh, the second place guys got disqualified, his team moved up to second place overall. So Noguchi, having had his, his biggest moment in the sun, um, unfortunately suffered head injuries at Mandalika um, in the Asian Championship. And three days later, 22 year old. Um, departed from us which is very very sad you, you know there's there's some great young Asian riders he being one of them and uh, it's extremely sad for his family that you know off the back of something that they would have been absolutely celebrating 10 days later um, he's no longer with us just goes to show you though doesn't it you never know what's going to happen in motorbike racing no you don't and and you know the sad thing is that that's not the first time we've had to sort of share this kind of news and it and it won't be the last time sadly but um but all of our thoughts uh and prayers are, are with him and, and his family uh and friends at this sad time uh, a great loss uh, of talent uh to the motorcycle world but uh, as as we say we all share a passion and that is racing and and uh, particularly in this instance uh, on two wheels and that is exactly uh, what will be happening this weekend it is austria we're recording this on thursday the 17th of august uh, and uh, well all the track action kicks off uh, tomorrow in austria on friday uh, in spielberg in the styrian mountains key it's beautiful there it really is it's remote it's completely unique i mean when you first go there you think God, we're never going to get out of here on Sunday night after the race. It shouldn't be the first thing that goes through your mind. But you, when you're a mobile racer, when when you're a motorcycle team, you're always planning every eventuality, where you park, how you can get out, which which, which way you got your hire car parked and pointed, um, ready for the for the for the next trip, if you like. It's all a planning type situation. So there, you think we're going to get stuck in here for sure. But they clear that track. They get you in and out of there so well, very well organised. I mean. It's got a really checkered history. Uh, Osterite ring as was once. Then it was known as the A1 ring somewhere in there. Zeltweg. Zeltweg was a, was an airfield track that was just down the road. So mistakenly, a lot of people consider this, call this place Zeltweg as well back in the day. So it's had various incarnations. I mean, at one point, you know, the local government spent like 32 million quid on it and it all went toes up and didn't work out. Then Dietrich Masasic came on board, you know, the, the Red Bull man and, and basically bought it. And propose something like four hundred odd million pounds worth of of developments on the on the racetrack, which then was opposed by every tree hugger in in the area. And you can understand it when you look around the place. I mean, it, there are some places where you stick motor race tracks, and you think this this is not this will never work. Um, it was already there; it would never be there if it hadn't been there previously. Um, but they have done a brilliant, brilliant. I've had to shorten the track, I and mean, the Osterite Ring originally. It was a really fast flowing racetrack that, that some very famous names um, went very quickly around back in the day for Formula One and the like. Um, and then, of course, it, it, it had a, a much shortened incarnation that World Superbikes were the first to go there. I think it was at 96 or something around then that we had the World Supers that went there as well, when it was known as the A1 ring then in that incarnation. It's been modified a lot since uh, Massastich got hold of it. Red Bull now, you know plow the money in as well because that's his company so the red bull ring is what it's known as now um we've had a modification there obviously after that massive zarco and morbidelli um pile up down towards turn three i think it is um they stuck a chicane in there last year um if you remember the zarco morbidelli crash zarco tagged the back of morbidelli at some getting on for 200 mile an hour bikes leapt down the track and flew over the head of valentino rossi um, in particular, um, and even Rossi, I'm, I remember s the, the state of affairs. It it looked like he was scared for the first time ever. I think Vinales was the other one, of course. Maverick Vinales was the other one involved in that. They didn't get hit, but if they had got hit, we could have had the biggest tragedy in motorcycle racing to date. If the size of the names involved um, were to be considered. Um, so we've got that chicane. Um, so it's about 2.7 miles round. 
um, always produces great race. The, the, the most winningest, to use the good old disgusting Americanism, um, is Andrea De Vizioso. And if you remember brilliantly, he and Mar- Marquez, you know, swapping places through Rint Curve, the, 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 what was the final corner, although there's two corners now. So Rint Curve, another famous Formula One guy, if you want to look him up, there's great stories behind Yock and Rint as well for, for, for this track. Um, but I mean, it was just those two boys. And I always remember as, as Mark has always took that dive down the inside for the final corner and, and the Vizioso, the, the, the flick of the hand, you know, like as he brushed him off both, you know, verbally, physically, and literally as they got to the line and won a game. Um, the Dobby and, and Mark Marquez were brilliant around there. I don't think Mark Marquez is going to have much to do with that this year though. No, I, I, it's one, you know, it's one of my favorite tracks actually for for racing because it, it, it it's so undulating you know it's up and down and you, especially the, in the first half you up to turn one especially you go uphill and then once you get to the second half of the track it's all pretty much downhill I often describe it, it at least in, in four-wheel terms as a bit of a slalom ride you're suddenly going down down the toboggan weaving left and right long sweeping uh turns and it always seems to produce uh some fairly good racing like you've just said there but but on on the marquez stuff i mean he's he's been coming out this week uh, well, in between we last sat down to record it and this recording that, you know, his approach that he took in Silverstone, <clears throat> excuse me, his approach that he took in Silverstone, uh, where he kind of just sort of almost sat back a bit, wasn't really pushing too much in the sprint, just riding on on pure feeling. He says he wants to carry on with that and stick with it for this weekend in Austria. But I suppose he has to do that because he hasn't really got many other options to, to try and get this pace off the bike. He hasn't. I mean, I think that the, the, this is a KTM track. It's their KTM test track. Obviously, KTM is Austrian, so we, we end up back at a place where they've, they've done a lot of testing. You've got to reckon the KTMs are going to be somewhere like, you know, at least Honda have, have been, you know, on the podium, I suppose, this year at some stage or another, whereas Yamaha have been struggling like mad all year long. In fact, Yamaha are the poorest of the five manufacturers out there at the moment. But what is he doing, Mark Marquez? It's a question that everybody's trying to get to the bottom of. I mean, they've We've all looked to see if he's going to jump ship. You know, KTM have pretty much ruled that out for next year now. Although, you know, Marquez well, Mark's not... been saying that he thinks KTM is going to be the top manufacturer in a few years' time. Yeah, which which kind of makes you think that, that that you know KTM have been pushing to get another team on the grid as well, haven't they? So you've got a situation here where you know that there is something going on in the background. This is mm. the time of the year for those final few, you know, twists and turns of contracts and and manufacturers and management to get it all sorted for 2024 and beyond. Um, some it's going to give, and we're going to hear all of a sudden, that's for sure. He hasn't sort of confirmed anything to do with Honda, even though he is contracted to Honda next year. So, you know, you, you get the feeling that, that that KTM are pushing to get a bit more room on the grid if they can. Um, I think the official line is that, you know, well, actually, there's, there's room on the grid, but we were kind of reserving that for another manufacturer to come in. Well, there ain't no manufacturers coming in. There's no one else coming in at all. So Kawasaki aren't interested, BMW aren't interested. You know, to, 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 to jump into MotoGP at this particular point when it's at its most competitive ever, you're going to get you're going to get blown into the weeds for about five years, I would think, if you just brought a new motorbike to it. And is BMW up for it? Well, you wouldn't think so because they're struggling even in their domain, which is well suited. Yeah. Kawasaki have been out of stuff pretty much everywhere. For a long time, I mean, okay, World Superbikes, their bike is still competitive, but you wonder how much of that is down to Jonathan Ray. Um, quite a lot, I would suggest, and so on and so forth. It's it's not an option. I mean, if I were Dorna, probably is of course is money again. Dorna have to pay quite a lot of money to get these guys there, but you would say KTM, they wanted a satellite team. I think that's the point. I think that Dorna didn't. They wanted a a full factory berth rather than another satellite team. Well, it's all the bloody same thing now, if you ask me. Is Pramac a satellite team to Ducati? Yes, it is a satellite team to Ducati, but he's got full factory bikes, and you can pretty sh- be pretty sure that the link between the two is quite close. In fact, all the Ducati links are quite close, and so on. It's only, it only comes down to personnel and who gets the, the, the first pick at the factory bit. Um, obviously it's going to be the red bikes first rather than Pramac. It's going to dribble down to them at some stage. But sometimes there's an advantage in being a satellite team. You are running stuff that you know works from the previous year because you're 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 on slightly older data, perhaps you know slightly different information to the full factory. Being full factory is sometimes 
quite a burden because you're running stuff or you're about to run stuff that you it's not really been tried tested and, and used at all the racetracks that you're about to go to so you don't really know how it's going to work out when you get there sometime they work it out very quickly yeah. so i getting back to mark Marquez, i suspect there is quite a lot of rummage in already the place to be if you're anywhere is outside the door offices just sit there and watch who goes in and out. I mean, take I, your deck chair. I, I love it. I, I pull my chair. Luckily, because I'm I'm very good friends with Mike Trimby at uh, the International Race Teams Association. You know, I'll sit on their deck, on their little silver chairs out on the raised deck, watching people going in and out of garages. And in and it is just the best place to be. Um, and sometimes you get whiff a whiff of what's going on. I haven't. I purposely because he is a friend. I always look for information from other places rather than from Mike's office because otherwise that compromises him and anybody to do with Erta. Not that he would tell me anything was secret, of course, because that doesn't happen. And it is a very secretive place now. You know, you do not get mechanics um, collaborating in bars or pubs or wherever it might be. And this is one of the places where you could do that, of course, and it's wonderful there from the from just up the road. There's some wonderful towns where the bars are. We'll get there in a minute. Um, <laughs> but it is a situation where you used to meet up. Yamaha would be, you know, eating and drinking with other mechanics from other places. Honda, Ducati, particularly. The, the, you know, it was a very social place. The MotoGP paddock. Not anymore. I mean, contractually, we touched on it last time. You know, when we were talking about with James, James Tozland, of course. When we were talking about um, you, you, you buy the mechanics, you buy the techs. KTM did that. They bought in a lot of really good guys. Plenty of people from Repsol Honda went to KTM when KTM got big for MotoGP. Um, and I think that that's something now, and I mentioned at the time, I bet those contracts, mechanics contracts, are stricter than they've ever been. Um, you remember we had that, was it was it Ferrari gate? I can't remember now. You'll be, you know, you'll, you'll be able to remember this. When somebody moved across and took the design drawings for a front wing or something with them. Um, oh, was that? That wasn't during the old, the, all the spy gate stuff, was yeah, it? Yeah, it was. Um, there was yeah, yeah. Something going on. And of course it was, yeah, there was, you, you can imagine that, I would imagine that the mechanics in future, if they decide to leave a manufacturer, will be on gardening leave as per a contract situation where they won't be able to move across. Once you've gone one year down the road, everything they knew is no use if everyone's worked it out. So it's, you, you, it's, yeah, I, I think we'll see much stricter contracts. We're in for a really turbulent period because of the, the extra races that we're doing, the extra flyaways that we're doing, the proximity of them in the calendar. We're going to have knackered people looking for a, for a, a different option. There are going to be people looking for options at the end of 2023. Um, makes it very, very exciting behind the fence, behind the scenes. Um, but back to Mark Marquez. I keep dodging the issue, don't I, with Mark Marquez? Uh, yeah. Oh, I'll oh, 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 go back there. Okay, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I mean, it's, 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 the world's best motorcycle racer, as was. Not yeah. the moment, but as was. And I haven't written him off yet. Um, is looking for another motorbike. You know, Honda have not produced what he would expect from them, which is amazing, really, that we're in that situation. We've got the winter to come. It'll be interesting to see where we go with that. Then we move on to Yamaha. You know, I see that Lynn Jarvis is doing very long interviews at the moment with various journos in the paddock to try and explain the position. But you've got a very frustrated um, you know, Fabio Quattararo who is looking to Mizano, the next test. If they don't bring something to that test, that actually improves what they're looking for. And Mizano is a funny old place because depending on the weather, you know, times are not something you can judge it by because the, the track can give you, you know, fast times or particularly slow times depending on the weather, the temperature and all sorts. And Mizano is a really tricky test track, great from a riding perspective. But it will be down to whether Fabio feels that, 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 that Yamaha have brought something to that test. That is worthwhile. That he's got yeah. in the head. They haven't done so far in every single thing he's done. If you if you look at where they've been all year long, and particularly at the tests, Yamaha have not brought him anything that's that's that put a smile on his face. So a lot of unhappiness there. Alex Rins moves up in alongside him. Morbidelli goes across to to uh, where's he gone? Pramac is he Morbidelli? Um, I don't think he's confirmed. VR forty six. I think I think he's going to VR forty six, and he Bezeki will probably go to Pramac. Pramac. Uh, Morbidelli. To- yeah, I mean. I can understand Morbidelli is at home with the VR46 organization. They, they, you know, they nurture him. So you, you can understand Zarco, Zarco LCR then in that case, he's got to go to the LCR because there isn't anywhere else because uh, yeah. Rins has moved across to, to Yamaha. So it looks like Zarco might be there unless we're in for a shock. 
And will there be a situation where Dorna relent and give a couple of spaces to another satellite team for KTM? Now, that will put the cat amongst the pigeons. I think they are. I, I, I vote that, personally. Well, I me think too. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we're going to have any dissent over the, our viewers <laughs> no. on that particular one. <laughs> More bikes. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, please. Um, well, look, let, let's, this weekend then, um, for those who are maybe traveling out there as we speak or just arriving or even maybe planning a trip for next year, could give us give us your insider's guide. I think I think the weather's going to be a, a bit mixed, starting off a bit wet and then getting drier and sunnier. But you know what what is there to do? Because it is, as you say, said right at the start, a little bit of an isolated place, but it is beautiful. Yeah, it, no, it's fantastically beautiful. I mean, the Styrian, you know, Tyrolean mountainside and the like around you is is, is a fantastic place. When you first drive there, you know that anywhere that that that's green, that that is that green, is definitely suffering from a lot of rain at some stage during the course of the year and regular amounts. So you can have like it is scheduled for Friday could be you know wet and thunderstorms Saturday and Sunday 28 30 degrees something like that and you can cook there as well in that uh, you know it can get very very warm indeed but the racetrack itself is pristine everything around it there's a there's a lot of fields the left hand side as you as you if the tracks on your right the left hand side as you come in there's a lot of fields and you wonder why why are they so you know they're not for cars or anything like that they're for push bikes they've got like that, that you know absolutely Thousands and thousands and thousands of, of bays for push bikes, so you can cycle in from wherever you are and park them up. And I can't think of any nicer way to get to a racetrack, to be frank with you. I mean, particularly one in that kind of area. Now, if you're smart, obviously I'm not, so this is something I've never done before, but you, you should try and book one of those beautiful guest houses on a hill. Now, they're booked miles in advance, you know, possibly years in advance, but if there's one or two of you alone, you might be able to find a room somewhere that's nearby that's in one of those beautiful sort of, you know, countryside picture book type um, chalets. Outside of that, the hotel situation is not great. You've got to be a bit further away from the track. And, and the hotels there aren't exactly the one we've stayed in, and we've stayed in it, you know, with Repsol Honda or Honda staying in the hotel. No air conditioning at all. So if you get the wrong room, you are cooking. You are sweating your <laughs> what's its off all night long. Doesn't matter how many win you know, you open the windows and it's on the on the town square. This is Leoben, the um, the place down the road. Um can't park anywhere. I <laughs> funny enough. <laughs> I um I thought I'll do just have a little bit of research before we do the OMG Motor GP. He's got the folder out. And it's all my bloody tickets for parking. But what you've been given parking tickets? <laughs> Yeah, I never did pay them. <laughs> <laughs> did you just get away with it? Well, I don't know whether we get away with it, but there, there, there might be an upside to Brexit yet. <laughs> just don't, or is that a thank you very much, BT? Yeah, don't uh, pay your parking <laughs> fines. Um, so it, it's kind of like um, quite a tricky place, but there's loads of places to go. I don't know whether you got the the, the, uh, the picture of one of my favourite bars I sent you earlier on. Um, uh, the, 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 you know, there's a big tower by. The, I think it's called the River Mur, M-U-R, that flows massively fast flowing river through the through this particular town that we always stayed in. And there's a big square. And of course, the Austrians know how to eat. So you've got good food all, all over the place. Bars, you know, beer's good in Austria as well, which is pretty, pretty good. And this 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 race meeting used to be back to back with Aust uh, with uh, the Czech round. So you used to have the Czech round one weekend and then the Austrian the other. And they used to um, transpose every year. So... Um, used to be great because you could spend one weekend in Czech Republic, next weekend in Austria, or vice versa. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't happen now, which is a great shame because that used to be a good sort of 10-day trip, really. Um, highly recommended from a racing point of view. Yes, the track itself is brilliant, maintained, very swift at getting you in and out. If you're, in the, if you're lucky enough to be in the press office, which is miles away from the track the big tunnel that goes underneath they don't really you can tell tracks that have got money because it's spent here um what else from a there isn't much else from an entertainment point of view um there's no big i bank. mean red bull red bull normally put on some good stuff in the well they did for the formula one yeah you've got in, in the build-up to the races you've got i think yeah, well, we have like the red bulls and the jet yeah, yeah, yeah actually, one, of them, one of them crashed he managed to get back up again, but it was a bit embarrassing. We just think, oh my God. But there's a lot of Red Bull have obviously a massive presence there. 
they do and that of course you get the flybys and you get all the bits and yeah. pieces that go with it which we didn't have at Silverstone and that's what I think what I meant by money you yeah. know like Silverstone is always on a on a on a, on a poor man's budget um, whereas Red Bull Ring is on the other end of the scale the richest man's budget yeah. um, you know I think that, that, that even they've done well there. I mean, Master Stitch must have a massive influence, but there is a massive lobby in Austria and Germany and the like from the green parties. Um, you know, you have some sympathy with them, I suppose, in as much as that we're all trying to head towards this environmentally friendly type situation and we've got a bloody motor race track in the middle of a beautiful um, countryside. Um, personally, bugger the countryside as far as I'm concerned and stick a motor race track in it. <laughs> Um, especially one that's ran as run as as well as this one is. Um, yeah. It's a great track. Would it be one of mine from a from a a, a box ticking exercise? Would it be a, a a bucket list? No, it wouldn't be. I think it's one that you should go to, um, but it isn't bucket list. It's not Magello for me. Um, okay. On, having said that, you know, atmosphere. If you're a if punter that's on the, you know, that side of the fence. For want of almost derogatory, then for a moment, I was going to say, you know, the privileged side of the fence, it's all a muchness everywhere you go, pretty much. But the uh, spectators, fan side of the fence, you get more for your money than you do, at, say, Silverstone, where it's a very difficult racetrack to pick up on atmosphere and the like, despite the fact they try their hardest. This place has atmosphere in bucket loads. Yeah, um, it does. And I think that that's, that's an important situation. And if you combine that, with you know a bit of a holiday this would be a racetrack if i was going to ride to it i would really enjoy this i think that the the ride to it through austria and through that region is beautiful and you you, you think road trip places like this yeah road trip wise i think it would be a good one and there's such mm. a lot around in that part of of europe as well that, that you can visit on your way um yeah it's, it's a it's a beautiful place beautiful racetrack beer is good and cold um and the racing can be quite shockingly good. It's fast. Um, and I think that we're going to be in for, you know, really, really tricky racing. It's difficult. We've done our predictions already. Yeah, we have done. You, they'll be on uh, in the last podcast with, with James uh, towards the end. And we'll, we'll put them on our social media as well to so check them out. Um, we've done our sprint race predictions and our Grand Prix predictions. So uh, get yours in as well in the comments below. Uh, your one, two, three for the sprint and your one, two, three. Uh, for the Grand Prix, please. Uh, but uh, yeah, the racing action or the track action kicks off tomorrow uh, and uh, the Austrian Grand Prix on Sunday. So we're looking forward to that. Should be a good one. See what the weather does. Uh, that's been a little extra hit. Keith? Well, I just wanted to quickly mention we've got Ike Laquona, of course, that that, that, that subs for um, Rin yep, in LPR. Back in. Lorenzo Savadori is the wild card for Aprilia. So Lorenzo mm -hmm. Savadori is in for a wild card. Marcus Ramirez subs. We know Marcus Ramirez subs for Sean Dillon Kelly in Moto 2. And someone to watch out from from Thailand, another Thai rider coming through as well. Takakorn uh, Buasar Buasri. I, you know, I don't even know the kid. He's wild carding for on the team Asia in Moto 3. So it might be an oh, okay. idea to keep an eye on somebody like him as well, uh, who's, who's in the deep end a bit, but you never quite know what they're going to come up with. Um, so there's a little bit going on um, this weekend. It's all extra. It's all extra. Uh, and uh, we will be looking back at it all next week as well. Uh, that, that show will be out on Tuesday, the main show. And we will have special guest Scott Smart joining us for that as well. So uh, that'll be a really good one. Do make sure that you tune in for that. And do make sure you like, subscribe, leave us a review as well. It's really important. In fact, somebody left, left us a really nice review on Apple Podcasts. Said, oh, five stars, love this. But actually only clicked the one star button. Uh, now that does have an effect. So if you could just go back and make sure you do click the full five stars. Uh, that'd be great. Uh, and if it is a one-star review, you know what? Don't bother. Just leave it. We don't need it. Uh, <laughs> but we appreciate I'll every see you review. In the next round. All right. <laughs> exactly. Uh, look, enjoy Austria this weekend. Let us know if you're out there, if you're going out there, if you've been before. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, we're OMG, MotoGP, and all the social medias. Uh, but me, Keith, and Scott Smart will be here next week to look back at it all. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. <laughs>